As I go through life, I am sure, like many of you, I have often felt like a square peg trying to fit into a round hole. And as I look around and flounder around, it seems that everyone else fits in. They are the perfect circles that I feel that I need to be. The story of how to fit in, how to succeed, how to change with the times is definitely not a, a new one. Yet, it does feel like the pegboard has changed a lot recently. We now live in a time where social media, television, advertising, hype the perfect while they treat everything else basically as hashtag laughable failure. This takes away our space to learn and also I believe causes a lot of the paralysis we see in society today. As reflected in this image, we all have paths to choose. And while there are plenty of quotes that tell us to embrace our decisions and let our square light shine for the circles to see, it is often very difficult, and it's been my experience, to find a toolkit to right yourself when self-doubt and toxic anxiety creeps in. It is hard to remain confident in your path when these sunsets turn into a thunderstorm. I wanted to give this TED Talk today to hopefully help people apply something that scientists use routinely to do incredible and world-changing discoveries. And what I'm referring to is the scientific method, and science I know, but please don't be scared, because um, this is really nothing fancy and not much different than what you used as a toddler to begin to understand the world. Basically, you make an observation, form a question around it, and then collect the facts. The next step then is use these to form a hypothesis statement and just a way to test your question. This usually takes the shape of if X controls Y, if I increase X, Y will increase. Or just to use this image for an example, we'd hypothesize that this peg is round or X, thus it will fit or Y in the, in the round hole, but not the triangle. So in this case, X is the independent variable, what we change, where y is the dependent variable, what we measure. The next step then is to conduct your experiment, analyze your data, and then form your conclusions. This is the way that discoveries move forward, and as long as you design a smart experiment, conduct it correctly, analyze the data, and then draw strong conclusions, you will learn something whether that hypothesis was right or wrong. I utilize the scientific method in um, leading laboratory where we look at how transplant recipients respond to their transplant. This is a model that we often use where a heart is removed from the donor mouse and then transplanted into the abdomen of uh, the recipient mouse by connecting it to the major artery and vein. Although this has not sustained the life of the mouse, that's the other heart, the endogenous heart does that, this does keep contracting so in this way, we can answer questions looking at the independent variable here, or x, the treatments, or the conditions, and how that impacts on the y, what we measure, the function. So basically, this is my pegs, my peg board at work. This is the data then that we generate with this, and all it shows here is the percentage of survival, this is a survival curve, and the days post-transplant. And just so you can get your bearings on this type of figure, when we inject PBS, our salty water, into the mice, you can see 100% of the grafts are lost by day 10. In this experiment, what we were asking was a question about whether a protein naturally made by your body that had been previously shown to be protective in a mouse model of heart attack by acting directly on the heart tissue could protect a heart transplant. So our hypothesis was, since IL-33 is directly protective on heart tissue, it will protect the graft. And you can see after transplantation of the hearts, and then we started to inject IL-33, we did see this nice protection and increased survival in this mouse. So Eureka. Yet, when we asked the second part of our question, was it acting directly on that heart, we used mice shown here, which lacked the receptor. So the recipients could not see IL-33, but the heart still could. So in this case, we lost all the hearts. So hashtag laughable failure. But when we followed up on that, this was actually the biggest discovery. What we had done when we followed up on it is we had identified a new immune population that could actually respond to IL-33 and tissue damage. And so we followed up on that, and now we hope we can translate that into the clinic in order to help people have better outcomes after transplantation. 
And while medical discoveries are often reported or perceived to be eureka moments, they often are just that we had completed in our heart transplant studies, a little bit of being right, a little bit of being wrong, until you eventually either answer your question or solve the problem. This man is Thomas Starzl. He's often known as the father of transplantation. And he initiated early attempts to do liver transplant into people. He did this in the 1960s. And the first seven transplant recipients had survived anywhere from zero to 23 days. This was such a laughable failure, I guess, that Tostarzel and the transplant community put a three-year ban on completing the procedure. And it was during that time it became obvious to Dr. Starzel that they needed to learn more. To quote him, we had to go back to the laboratory because we could not make it work. So in that three-year period, they tested hypotheses first around the procedure. And once they had a procedure that would work, it became quite obvious they needed to block the recipient's immune system from destroying the grafts similar to what you saw when those mice lost their hearts by day 10. Over and over, year after year, for decade after decade, they tested hypotheses, developed new drugs, new procedures, and eventually they got to the point where in the 1960s, 0% of the liver transplant recipients made it to one year. By the 1970s, they were at 15%. Today, one year survival after liver transplantation is above 90%. And the outcomes after that are spectacular. More importantly, through their persistence, their passion, using the scientific method, the procedures they develop, the drugs, more than 100,000 people each year globally have their lives saved by solid organ transplantation. So this is truly a remarkable achievement in a little under 50 years. So this is where we are today. We are now have moved on from giving life-giving grafts to ones now that are designed to improve the quality of life for the recipient. This is Andy Sadness after a failed suicide attempt. And then on the right, this is the same individual following a face transplant completed in 2016. This was a multi-day procedure. It was completed by around 60 surgeons, nurses, doctors, support staff. It was aided by 3D printed models. At the end of the day, it was expected to cost around a million dollars. It gave the recipient the ability to smile, to taste, to talk, to smell, but probably most importantly, to leave the house without being a distraction. So this is truly a remarkable achievement. And this gives an example in one field of medicine about what kind of advanced and prosperous society we're living in. In fact, these kinds of discoveries are happening all throughout medicine. And in the last 50 years, we have increased life expectancy more than the prior 1,000. It is safe to conclude that as a human being living today, you will live a longer and healthier life than at any time in the Earth. However, there are also other stats that are emerging. As shown here, there are plenty of people who feel depressed and despondent. Approximately one out of five Americans at some point in their life, irregardless of age, will be diagnosed with depression. More concerning is the increased rates in suicides. And as you can see in states with the dark blue, these have seen a, up to 40 and 50% increase in suicide since 2001. And unfortunately, I think in this country, we often believe or hypothesize that depression is a result of failure, um, a trait of the weak. Yet, if we just look a little bit, it seems like the people who we aspire to be, the people who we hope our kids become, are having the same sort of troubles. In fact, if you look a little bit closer, it might actually be worse for them. Medical students and graduate students have a two to three time rate, higher rate of depression and anxiety. We're all aware of how weekly now we lose musicians, actors, popular public figures to suicide. This picture, for those of you who aren't aware, is Michael Phelps. He's actually the most decorated Olympian in the history. He recently spoke quite bravely about how, in 2014, he came very close to taking his own life because of depression. Anytime you complete an experiment, you have to have the correct facts. And unfortunately, I think, in this country, we often are using facts that are skewed by Instagram filters and then promoted on Facebook. I think often we choose to ignore facts that don't fit our existing hypothesis or belief about success and perfection. 
I think it's time that we stop only listening to the people that are trying to sell us the kits to change square pegs into round ones. I also hope we can admit, based on the statistics and the evidence, that depression, anxiety, and the self-harm that comes with it are important, life-threatening illnesses. We live in a country where we can celebrate giving a person, after a failed suicide attempt, a new lease on life with a face transplant. I hope very soon we can celebrate the discoveries and innovation that allow us to give the next person a new lease on life before they try to commit suicide. This is a picture from when I was in graduate school. This is me in the middle. And I probably would have posted this picture on Facebook had it been around. Um, but in it, I'm at a party. It was called the $15 formal. You had to dress yourself for $15. It was a great time. You can see at that time in my life, I had good friends. I had a supportive family, a loving wife. As a graduate student, I actually owned a house, had a great dog. Things were going very well. But in this picture, I'm suffering major depression. Um, that very night, I went home, I was laid in bed, and I was paralyzed it to the point that I could not even talk to my wife. Um, I felt like I was going crazy, and I guess a little bit I had. After um, a lot of counseling and medication, I mean, there were lots of things that were driving this depression, but through those, it really did stop the negative voices or lessen them that told me I was not as good as everyone else. I was less than perfect. Also during that time, I felt very alone. I felt defective. Um, and it's really unfortunate that I did not start using my developing researcher skills. You know, why couldn't I have looked up a few things, provided myself the stats that I've just been providing you? If I would have got out of myself just a little bit, looked around, read up on a few things, I would have realized that I was not alone. In the medical school, the graduate school that I was walking through, one out of three people probably felt just like me. Would this have changed the depression? Probably not. But it would have changed my hypothesis or my belief system around it. Instead of thinking, there is something wrong with me, I am defective, I should hide, it will go away, maybe instead I could have hypothesized, I have depression, like a lot of people, if I do something about it, it will get better. I guess the important thing to remember anytime is that making sure we are using the right facts, not just the facts that feel right at the time. These two pictures were posted on Facebook, the first on the left in the fall of 2015, the second on the right in 2017. And from the smiles in the picture, you would never gather that in each instance, a few weeks later, we had to seek treatment for one of our daughters in for anorexia associated with depression and anxiety. And we talked a lot to our daughters during this time, and the word perfect kept coming up. But you would ask them what it meant to be perfect. You know, they wanted the perfect abs, the perfect body, as middle schoolers. But when you ask them what it meant to be perfect, they never had a solid answer. And it's like, and how did you know when you get there? You know, who told you? And they never really could provide an answer. So I guess they were just hoping to figure it out before they starved or exercised themselves to death. I think the first thing you do when your 11-year-old daughter is diagnosed with anorexia is, of course, blame society. You blame society for all the attention that's put on physical appearance of women. But at the end of the day, that really doesn't stop that nagging voice in your head that says you failed as a parent. And I hate to admit it now, but I did spend a lot of time worrying about what people thought. Thought of me, thought of my daughter, thought of us as a family, thought of us as parents. You know, it felt a lot like graduate school again. I wanted it quickly and quietly to go away. My recovering daughter, on the other hand, talked about it openly and honestly with everyone. She said it made her feel a lot better. When my second daughter was diagnosed with anorexia, it became quite obvious we needed to find a way to pivot away from th paths that were being driven by depression, anxiety, and anorexia to unhealthy outcomes. Well, again, it did feel like we had failed, this time, we also admitted we had learned from the last time. We reached out sooner for medical interventions. We actually, honestly, spoke and just really did not worry about what people thought this time around. We talked openly and honestly with it to people, and our first daughter was right. It did feel a lot better. So I guess who says you can't learn things from your kids? 
Also, when things repeat, it gives you the chance to do a second experiment. You get to reanalyze your facts. You get to adjust your hypotheses. And so this time, we not only question society's role, we begin to begin questioning our own. Was it maybe the genetic material that we passed on to our girls that set them up for anxiety and depression? Was it maybe our parenting style that helped foster anorexia? And at the end of the day, after talking to specialists, reading up on it, we had to come to the conclusion that it was probably all of the above. And while it really did suck to admit that you played a role in this traumatic events your kids were going through, at the end of the day, it just, we came to the realization, this is just data. We have to use it to pivot to a better outcome. And by admitting our imperfections, it, we became a lot better equipped to actually help our girls. Realizing that I was an independent variable or an X in the Y or the things my daughters were going through, I became empowered. It became very obvious to me that I could change X or myself in order to see how it changed Y. Also through all this, I really have learned that depression is quite common in girls my daughter's age, and that anorexia is increasing both in boys and girls in this country. And it is actually the most lethal form of mental illness. And while these are scary facts to say, scary facts to think about, often we have to accept the facts in order to change them. So what I would like to leave you with today is when you're feeling overwhelmed, that self-doubt is creeping in, give yourself permission to step back, treat life as an experiment. Address the questions, understand the facts, use good facts, understand the independent variables, including the emotions, form a hypothesis, test it, make your conclusions, give yourself a way to move forward. You've seen how in transplant medicine, scientists have used this to do incredible world-changing discoveries. My hope for you is that you can use similar strategies to allow yourself to do better, more confident pivots instead of the impulse-driven decisions that often creep in when the thunderstorms roll in. And most importantly, I hope it'll allow you to better enjoy your imperfect life and the imperfect people that fill it. Thank you.